So what we're going to do now, we're going to continue our conversation about pricing. We said that as we seek to sell our products everywhere around the world, whether they're tangible or intangible, so whether it's a good or a service, remember we said that we use the term product in a broad way, we said that one of the things that we would likely do is adjust the price depending on the market in which we're going to sell. So depending on the level of disposable income in a given market, it's very likely that we're going to charge a different price in markets around the world. So we talked last time about demand-oriented approaches to pricing, cost-oriented approaches to pricing, profit-oriented approaches to pricing, and let's just briefly, let's just take a couple of minutes to recap what we talked about, and then today what we're going to talk about is price elasticity of demand, pricing objectives, pricing constraints, and also demand factors. So who could tell us what some of the demand-oriented approaches are that we talked about last time? What's uh, an example of a demand-oriented approach? So remember we said that the approach that the approaches that we talked about can be classified in different ways. Some of them focus on demand, some of them focus on cost, some of them are focused on profit. And we said that when we talk about demand-oriented approaches, we're talking about, for example, skimming. We said that once we decide that we're going to penetrate a particular market, once we decide we're going to sell in a particular market, whether it's France or China or Korea or Africa or Colombia, wherever it is that we decide to sell our product, we're going to need to define in our marketing plan a pricing strategy. So we might, we might implement a skimming pricing strategy, which means that we introduce the product at a high price and then lower the price of the product in a planned way over time. So it's not in reaction to what competitors are doing or the economy. This is our strategy that we're going to introduce the product at $500 and then six months later, reduce the price 10%. And six months after that, reduce the price another 10%. And then six months after that, another 10%. And what is the logic behind doing that? Why would a company do that? What is the reason that we would do that as an organization if we decide that we want to sell our product in China? Why would we introduce the product at $500 and then six months or 12 months later lower the price 10% and then another 10% after that? Because you know that you'll have people who will buy it at the first price, at the highest price, and that want it, the first one right when it comes in. Absolutely. So as an organization, it suggests that we believe that there's a small percentage probably of the market that are willing to buy it at a higher price in the adoption curve model and diffusion of technology model, we said that, yeah, we suspect that there's innovators. That's what Joshua was talking about, is that there's innovators, and maybe 3 to 5% of the population are willing to buy it when it first comes out and pay $500. Yeah, I was just going to contribute that uh, there's just people who have different willingnesses to pay at the end of the day. So economically, if you want to capitalize on every single person's individual group, because you'll have, for example, the same people, if you start at a lower price, for example, the same person that you'd have that would pay 500 if you're selling at 300 then you're, like, economically speaking, out $200. So if you set the price at a certain height, then you get that you know, category of people, and then it moves on down to every single, so you just capitalize on your market. So you think that skimming 
could be a very compelling pricing strategy depending on the market and also the category. It's very common in technology categories that this strategy, this pricing strategy is used. So in electronics, for example, high-tech electronics, it's very common that companies introduce um, innovations and then they introduce it at a relatively high price and then over time they lower the price because um, of what Joshua and also Harvey is saying that some people are willing to buy it at the high price but then we know that in markets that are elastic that are price sensitive that and we said also, we, we wanted to clarify that there's different levels of price sensitivity. So it's not all or nothing if we say the market is price sensitive. So in any given category, we could have a discussion about the level of price sensitivity. Doesn't mean that everybody would either increase or decrease their demand for that particular product when price is changed. But in um, electronics, for example, we've seen over time numerous products being released into the marketplace and using a skimming strategy. One of the advantages is that it helps us control our investment in production capability. So if what Joshua and Harvey is saying is true that when we introduce the product at let's say $500 that maybe only 3 or 5% of the population in China is going to buy the product, that means that we don't need to have manufacturing capability to make a billion units. Why is that important? Why is that important that we don't need to have a manufacturing facility that could make a billion units? And we don't need to invest $50 billion in a manufacturing facility. You don't need to supply quantity to demand it. So and importantly, despite all the research that we've done, what if the product is a bust? What if we don't... We, we, had, we thought we had everything figured out, and then at the last minute, what if a competitor leapfrogs us with a product that's more innovative? Now what do we have? A $50 billion manufacturing facility that could make a product that's obsolete. So that's something to, um, to keep in mind in terms of one of the benefits and um, in managing price, starting out at a high price, what would be one of the disadvantages, though? One of the disadvantages then would be that, well, if we try to manage the product life cycle in a category that's very innovative, then a competitor could enter the market. So remember, we said one of the risks of charging a high price is that it becomes attractive to competitors. That's definitely a risk. So to some extent, with a relatively low level of production, our costs, our total cost, which is our variable cost and our fixed cost, our total cost, certainly when we first start to sell the product, when we first start to produce it, are going to be higher than when we're producing a very significant number of units. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we're going to be able to achieve some economies of scale. We're going to get up the learning curve. We're going to achieve some efficiencies. And when that happens, that means the cost to produce a unit is going to be less. The, the cost is going to go down over time. That's what we're anticipating. So there's going to be a learning effect, and our course should go down. But that being said, we're probably, when we first introduced the product, making a very 
significant profit. So we're expecting that our costs are going to go down even further, but at $500, our markup is probably pretty significant if we're implementing a skimming pricing strategy. And competitors know that. They see that. They see that in the market and they say, wow, if Stepanski could sell this at $500 and make money, then why shouldn't we? We should get into this market. <clears throat> because at $500, it's very lucrative. It's very profitable. So there's some advantages to a skimming strategy, and there's also some risks and disadvantages. Now, an alternative, then, is penetration pricing which is what Harvey was alluding to. An alternative would be that we introduce the product at a low price. So at the time of introduction, we introduce the product at a very low price. Presumably at that price we could still be profitable. And then the demand is going to be in a, in a very um, price sensitive market, in a market that's elastic, the demand is going to be very high. We need to be able to beat demand. So with skimming, Harvey said, well, we don't want to make more than is going to be demanded, but now we have a different problem. Now at a low price, now instead of at $500, we're at $50. The demand is going to be very substantial. Are we going to be able to meet demand? We're gonna we're gonna have to have a creative manufacturing strategy. So either we're gonna we have to decide whether or not our business is gonna be make to stock or make to order or some combination of the two. And if it is um, make to stock or make to order, then we also need to decide, well first, what's the difference? What's the difference between make to stock and make to order? Make to order is you wait for the customers to order it and then you make it, and then make to stock is you just have, you, you make, you produce the warehouse full of, I don't know, a couple thousand, and, uh, and then you wait for customers to order. So everybody got whatever Ezra said? Is that make to stock means that you make the product prior to getting the orders, and you're holding inventory. Whereas make to order means that when you get the orders, that's when you make the product. That's when you manufacture it or assemble it. Now why would we be forced, even as much as we might want to um, be a make to order business, which is why? Why would we want to be a make to order business? What's the advantage? Well, it's going to hold merchandise with Absolutely. So make to order. We don't have the inventory holding course. We're not tying up working capital. We're not tying up cash. But why might we have to still make to stock? What would force us into that situation? The demand is too high. The demand is too high and what does that mean then? You need, you need to get the products out quicker. More quick. And that means that but the only way we could do that is to anticipate demand and 10 months before start making the product. Because when we see demand in the system, when we get the orders, we're not going to be able to respond quickly enough. So either we started making it literally 10 months before, and that's not crazy, it might sound crazy, but um, very often that's the case, 10 months before. We're making the product and we're holding it in inventory. So that when we do get the orders, we'll have inventory, enough inventory on hand. Now Joshua says, yeah, well, I'd rather not be in that situation. I know. I know, you don't want to tie up all that cash in inventory. But there are certain limitations to how many units we're going to be able to make in a given period of time. And when demand is for millions, then obviously that's not something that you could make in a weekend for most products, a month, even a few months. 
That means very often the product has got to be made six to 12 months beforehand. So very often for popular products that are sold during the fourth quarter, for the holiday season, they're made 12 months before they start making them. Before the holiday season is even over, they start making for next year. Because when they're, the products that they're making in November, it's, it's too late. That's for the, for the next year. Because unless they're going to airship it, it's going to take 30 to 45 days on literally a slow boat from China. It's not really a boat, it's a ship actually. The boat is generally thought of as smaller, right? So I mean, it's a huge ship, but from China to it, it takes a long time. And what else, what else did we talk about? So those are some demand-oriented approaches to pricing. We also talked about cost-oriented approaches. We talked about cost plus pricing, and we talked also about standard markup. We also talked about, what else? Who could tell us what else we talked about? It was, it was there. You had, um, you know, like what kind of pricing strategies? We talked about prestige, prestige pricing. Absolutely, we talked about prestige pricing, where um, the reason a product is priced at a certain level is because as marketers we understand that at a higher price, the perceived value of the product is going to be greater. And so we deliberately price the product at a higher level so that we could establish a level of prestige for the product. So sometimes inexpensive is not good because sometimes people associate a product being inexpensive as being cheap or shoddy of poor quality. So what Ezra is saying is, yeah, so we've thought about that. So in some cases, what we do is actually the opposite, and we actually charge more for a product so that we can enhance the perceived value of the product. We talked about also lost leaders, how in some cases we'll promote a product at a low price to generate foot traffic into our store. And the expectation is, although that item is not profitable, the reason that we do that is because the expectation is that people will come into the store to buy the item that is being sold at a very cheap price. Like orange juice is very often a lost leader in grocery stores, for example. So there's people who come in to buy the orange juice because they know that um, it's on sale that week. And then the expectation is once they're in the store, they're going to wind up buying something else. In fact, the expectation is that um, they'll end up buying um, quite a few other items besides the orange juice that was on sale. Well, companies use that as like as like a, a strategy to like to sell to certain stores or chains of stores to be like, well, look, you know, our our, our product is a cheap product, and people are going to hear about it, they'll come buy it, and it'll it'll cause you know foot traffic, as you said. Well, absolutely. So if um, you're willing to offer a promotion, um, retailers. Absolutely, they're receptive to that. And it could be a way for you to get um, some shelf space in the store or a promotional end cap at the end of an aisle. So those are um, a variety of different pricing strategies that we talked about. What about, and there's others, but what are our objectives? What are some of our obje objectives when we think about our pricing strategy? So what are, what, when we think about whether or not we're going to deploy a penetration pricing strategy or a skimming strategy or cost plus, what, et cetera, what is some of the objectives 
as executives when we're thinking about selling our product in Israel, in Jamaica, in Mexico, in Korea, what is some of the pricing objectives? Now, depending on our strategy, or I, rather I should say depending on our objective, that's going to define our strategy, right? So now that we've talked about some of the different strategies, I want us to talk about what's motivating us. What is the reason for us selecting a skimming strategy or cost plus or penetration pricing? You have to figure out which, uh, which mode of pricing is going to be appropriate for your product and you have to also study the behaviors of your customers and your clients. Right. Absolutely. So we have to decide which is best. And when we determine a price, when we determine what price point we're going to sell our product, what is it that we hope to achieve? Profit. Profit is certainly um, one pricing objective. It's not always the case. What might be a, um, an alternate objective that we might have? Perceived value. Well, let, let's stick with what you said. You said profit. Well, market share. Maybe. It could be market share. So profit, the amount of profit is a pricing objective. And also market share. And depending on the particular market and the level of elasticity, so depending on what the price elasticity of demand is, that's going to determine whether or not the price <laughs> is going to have a positive or negative impact on our market share. So in some cases, if the market is not price sensitive, so if the market is inelastic, then we might be able to sell the product at a high price and still have a significant market share. But also another objective, besides profit, might be social responsibility. So what do you mean? Yes, so one of our pricing objectives, it may not be profit. It may not be to maximize profit. Our pricing objective for a particular item, remember that in um, a product line, we have a group of items, and then a group of product lines makes up a product mix. So a particular item, our objective may not be profit, our pricing objective. So in determining the price that we're going to sell the product, it might be to do something socially responsible, which means that we're going to sell prescription medication that normally sells for $150 a month for only 10% of that. So sell it to low-income elderly people for $15 a month. Now, with those kind of numbers, you probably think, well, yeah, well, you're probably not making any money if you're normally selling at $150 a month. You probably think, well, that would be a pretty huge margin. Is it really possible at $15 that you could still be profitable? Well, certainly not as profitable. So profit is not always the objective when we're determining the price. So certainly, the level of sales is a pricing objective. The profit, the level of profit, the market share, social responsibility, all of those are pricing objectives. We have to decide what is our pricing objective or pricing objectives. Once we've done that, then we're going to be able to determine the price for our product and whether or not it's going to be a demand-oriented approach to pricing, or a cost-oriented approach to pricing, or a profit-oriented approach to pricing. But first we need to know what we're trying to achieve. So if it's market share, like Ezra um, suggested, then what would you think our pricing approach would be if our goal is to maximize market share? So in other words, we'll sell 
more units than our competitors in the category. Do you remember I um, had shared with you, I said, you know, we might think that we're doing very well because we've sold 500,000 half gallons of orange juice. But then, right, that sounds like a lot. Does it sound like a, a, a big number? In a given week, let's say, to sell 500,000 half gallons of orange juice. That's a uh, pretty nice business to have. And we might think, and we're profitable, and the sales are obviously well over, we're talking about several millions of dollars for that week. And then we find out that one of our competitors sold 1,500,000 half gallons of orange juice. So if, it's, if we're the only two competitors in the market, what is our market share then? If we sold 500,000 units, 500,000 half gallon containers of orange juice. The, the, uh, the quarter, quarter of the so do we all agree? So the total volume sold that week was two million half gallon containers of orange juice. Our company sold 500,000. That means we have 20% share of the market. 25, huh? What did I say, did I say 20%? 20, 25% 20, uh, market share. We have 25% market share. So market share is very helpful because it gives us a sense of performance relative to the competition. See, we were very happy selling 500,000 half gallons of orange juice until we found out that our competitors are selling three times as much as us. Do you agree? Are you guys disappointed that competitors are selling three times as many half gallon containers of orange juice every week? So looking at market share is an important metric when we think about measuring our performance of our products around the world, we need some marketing metrics. So how do we know if we're doing well in China? How do we know if we're doing well in Israel? Well, one of the things we could look at is market share. We could look at it in terms of the percentage of units and also the percentage of dollar sales. Say it's possible that even the, even though they could be selling more, like more, doesn't necessarily mean they're they're making more. I mean, if if the numbers are, are, are like are like you said, then maybe maybe yes. But if the number wasn't that way, if if the you know if we we had let's say forty percent, they had sixty percent, but they're selling it for significantly less than we are. Well, maybe that's you know, that's a good point. So maybe we're selling the orange juice at. Four dollars for half a gallon, and they're selling it for two dollars for half a gallon. Well, there you go. So, then we need to understand why is that? Are they selling three times as many units at the same price, or is it because their price is half of ours? So that's um, very insightful. That's something that we need to find out. Dollar sales, for that very reason when we look at market share in terms of dollars, can be misleading because of what Ezra just pointed out. So in other words, if, if that's the case, if we're selling our orange juice at $4 and they're selling their orange juice at $2, then in terms of market share in, ter in, in units, they're gonna have 75% market share. But in terms of dollars, it's probably gonna be what, like maybe the other way around? Because their dollar volume is gonna be, what? Their dollar volume at two dollars, a million and a half units is three million, and ours is, what? Two million. <laughs> So we have, in terms of dollars, we have 40% share. In terms of units, we have 25% share. 
So it's very helpful to look at market share in terms of dollars and also in terms of units. Because when you look at the dollar share, it's misleading because a competitor in the market that charges a higher price, even if they're selling less units, they might very well have a greater dollar volume. Their dollar sales might be greater. So in terms of units, we said our market share is 25%, but in terms of dollars, it's actually, it turns out in this case to be 40%. What are some of the factors that are going to impact demand? As we think about selling our product everywhere around the world. Well, I think, well, if you think internationally, but also the economy very much. You know, how much money people are making, depending on what kind of product you are, if you're, you know, an expensive, more high-end or low-end, certainly going to have its effects. Absolutely. So the level of income, the level of disposable income, GDP. absolutely is going to be a factor. What else? What else is going to be important? Demand factors. We're talking about demand factors. What are the factors that impact demand? So the prices of related goods to the product. Absolutely. So the price of related goods, whether they are complementary. Remember, complementary, we're talking about an economics term. Not complementary as in free. We're talking about in economics, we use the term complementary and also substitute. So what Ruben is saying is that we need to know what is the demand for complementary products. So in other words, what is the demand for tea bags and what is the demand for tea kettles? Those products are complementary. They're used together. What is the demand for what? What are some other examples of complementary products? Peanut butter and jelly. What is um, an example of a substitute? So we also need to look at substitute products. That's going to impact demand. So what would be a substitute for tea? Well, there's a lot of beverages that might substitute for tea. Hot chocolate, coffee. So we would need to, in terms of the demand, the demand factors, we need to understand the demand for complementary products, for substitute products, the level of um, disposable income, and also the preferences, the consumer preferences, their tastes, their dietary requirements, what would be a good example of that that we talked about? Because we said McDonald's, interestingly, has been successful in operating around the world. So they're an outstanding example of a multinational company. They sell the Big Mac in pretty much every market around the world. Why are they able to sell the Big Mac? in every market around the world? What is the secret to their success? Go ahead, Evan. They, they, they change up whatever, uh, like they, some markets they can't, they don't like meats, they change up, like they make veggie burgers, they, they like, uh, it's called market segmentation. Uh, well, so they, they understand the different um, requirements, there's different dietary requirements. They still, try to sell the Big Mac in every market, but like you're saying, they, in some markets, they realize that the Big Mac can't be made of beef. They cater to every market. Absolutely, so they customize the Big Mac, they tailor the Big Mac globally, to the local market. And they act locally. <laughs> there you go. Well, everyone, think, think what? Think, think, think globally. Yeah. Think locally, act globally? Think globally, act locally. I got it, I'm not done. <laughs> so, they've done that very successfully. So it's not just a slogan for the company. Actions speak louder than words. 
So realistically, do you really think that they could sell a Big Mac in India that's made of beef? I mean, we're not even really sure if the Big Macs in the United States are made of beef, but that's a different story. But in India, if people even thought, forget about it, it really was made of beef, if people even thought that they were selling Big Macs that were made of beef, do you think they would be successful? It's just, I mean, um, it's just not going to be possible for them to have a profitable business in India if they're selling Big Macs that have beef in it. Did you want to add something? I, ju I just, I know you expect the answer no, they wouldn't be interested, but like, sometimes like all these nations are very interested in American culture, so maybe just out of curiosity, like saying, oh, that's a real Big Mac from America, they, they will really try. Yes, that's an excellent point. So that's part of the secret to their success is that despite the idea that there is anti-American sentiment in certain markets around the world, we know that there, there is a demand for American culture. And the Big Mac is certainly iconic. It's a, a part of American culture. And you're right that there's many markets where people want to purchase a part of American culture. They want to purchase a Big Mac, but what Evan is saying is that we're still going to sell the Big Mac, but instead of making it out of beef, we're going to make it out of vegetables. It'll be a, veg a veggie burger. So that's the brilliance to their strategy. That's how they're able to think globally, but act locally. So they know in that market, it can't be made of beef. So they still sell the Big Mac, they still sell the Big Mac, but um, it doesn't contain any beef. And in other markets, there, there's other requirements. It could be made of beef, but it, ha it has to be kosher, it needs to be halal. There's a lot of different requirements and they adapt depending on the market. Let's talk about different types of revenue. Because very often we talk about total revenue. But it's also helpful for us to understand average revenue. Which suggests what? What does that mean if we're looking at average revenue? Very often this is very helpful for us in retail, for example, to understand the average revenue per transaction. What does that mean? How is that helpful to us if we decide that we're going to operate these McDonald's in over a hundred countries around the world? Why do we need to know the total revenue but also the average revenue? So we look at the average revenue per transaction. We need to know how much people are spending per purchase. Once we know that, then we could try to impact that. So once we know what the average transaction amount is, then we could ask our sales force or our sales reps or our cashiers, whatever the case is, to maybe, for example, recommend other items on the menu. So if you know the average sale per transaction is $6, then in order to increase that, if we're going to increase the average sale per transaction, in order for us to increase our total revenue as well, then we might suggest to the cashier at the counter, to suggest other items. So to suggest that we offer them an apple pie. Or well, would you like french fries with that? Most of the time we don't even notice, we don't understand why, or we're not really thinking about, why do they say, would you like anything else? And you say, no thank you. Are you sure you don't want anything else? You're like, what is it with you? Why, I mean, why do you keep asking me that? Would you like a soda? Would you like an apple pie? Would you like an apple? 
And the reason why they're doing that is because they want to increase the average sale per transaction, the average amount of the revenue. So the average revenue per transaction. That's why they, I guess, now the new thing is like, oh, you know, upgrade your meal to like 25 cents more. It's appealing to most people. Like, why well, get a soda that's this big for 25 cents more? You get something that's three times the size. Absolutely, and that's a way that people can um, understand. So it's not just, well, do you want the small meal, the medium or the large, but you're talking for 50 cents. For 50 cents, they'll trade you up from a small to a medium meal. And this is because they're looking at these metrics, they're looking at revenue, and not just total revenue, but they're also looking at the transaction level. Because what does it mean, really, when you look at total revenue? We're just suggesting that well, somehow we're going to get more people to come to McDonald's. And so we could do that. Maybe we could advertise more to build awareness and drive traffic um, into the store. But then what about our existing customers? So when we look at behavioral segmentation, we look at the heavy users, moderate users, and the light users. So the question is, not just how do we attract non-users, but if somebody is a light user or a moderate user, how do we get them to buy another Big Mac? How do we get them to, how are we going to increase our average revenue per transaction? One thing also for marketing example is when you come into a restaurant and you see on the size medium $5.99 and a small like $5.25, and they see it, oh, it's so much more expensive, I'm not going to get it. But when you're in that situation, and they say, oh, it's only this much more, then it sort of gets you to thinking, you're thinking completely flip the run to the point where every time you come in now, you're just going to keep on getting the bigger meal. So for a marketing gimmick, is that something that you can use for other situations, such as like marketing a computer, marketing a car? Even this oh, absolutely. Well, in marketing, what we refer to, um, the way we refer to that approach is trading up the customer, um, which is not the same thing as bait and switch. Do you guys know the difference? Bait and switch is you advertise in August air conditioners for $50. And then when the customers show up at 6.30 a.m., you say we're sold out. However, have I got an air conditioner for you? They said, we don't have any air conditioners at $50, but I have an air conditioner here for you that's $450. The government says, no, that's bait and switch. They're definitely not okay with that. And they will close your business. That's unacceptable. And retailers, that's different from having a sale. Okay, you should, you can have a sale. It's understandable you might want to have some lost leaders and you're not going to have an unlimited quantity but uh, in stock, but you need to have merchandise. But people come into your store and of course all your air conditioners are different prices and so you have some that are 450, some that are 550, some that are 650, 750, 850, 950 and so um, what Joseph is saying, right, is that can we trade them up? Sure. They come in, they say, you know, I kind of like this one, it's $450. And you say, well, you know, for another $100, you could get a multifunctional um, remote that could not only control your air conditioner, but also could serve as a garage opener. And if you want to go up another $50, or another hundred dollars, you could get a air conditioner that has instead of 8,000 BTU, will have 10,000 BTU, which means that it could cool um, a larger space. And that's very common. We refer to that in marketing as trading up. And so that's, that's a very good point that happens all the time. And that's what we're trying to do when we say, can we, uh, 
What is it? They, what is the term that they use? Upsize you or? Upsell? No, upsell. Like no, but uh, in, the, in McDonald's? Supersize. Super super size. Exactly. <laughs> Can you supersize me? So what I mean is, so that actually what that is, is so that's a good example of trading up the consumer for 50 cents more, for a dollar more. You know, for $20 more, you could, you know, feed your neighbor's kid. But then the question is, <coughs> if you're feeding your neighbor's kid, can you take him as a dependent on your tax return? But well, that's a different topic. Nobody here is interested in taxation or accounting? OK, no problem. No, sir. <laughs> OK. So we said that total cost includes fixed cost and variable costs. Fixed costs are those costs that don't vary with the production quantity. It's always amusing to me when students write on an exam that fixed costs are costs that are fixed. I know this. But it's important to note that they're fixed in relation to the production quantity, which means that whether you make one unit or a million units, your fixed costs are unchanged within a relevant range. Why is that concerning? Why, why would we care about that? So in other words, we have certain fixed costs. Those are the costs that, let's say, for example, we might define the salaries that we pay the senior management team as fixed. They might have a variable compensation portion of their um, salary, of their, comp of their um, earnings, but if we're paying them $250,000 a year while they're working on the marketing plan and we're not producing any units, isn't that um, something to be concerned about? Aren't you concerned that we have $50 billion tied up in a manufacturing facility that's not manufacturing anything? Because those fixed costs, they're not invisible. We have to account for them. So it's a huge burden. So it's not like, oh yeah, take Zelkowitz, take as much time as you need, work on the marketing plan. If you get it done next month, okay. If not, the month after. The month after that is also good. But our fixed cost, <laughs> they, they we're still incurring the fixed cost. But it's within a relevant range. So an example of fixed cost would be like our property tax. So the property tax on a manufacturing facility is fixed. So if you have to pay property tax, it is what it is. You have to pay $100,000 a month for property tax to the state, and it doesn't matter if you're making one unit or a million units. But I said within a relevant range. Why is that? So take, for example, you might say, well, our liability insurance is fixed. And I would say, I would tend to agree with you, our liability insurance is fixed and we pay $10,000 a month for liability insurance for our organization. And it doesn't matter if we make one unit, and it doesn't matter if we make 1,000 units, or 10,000 units, or even a million units. But the reason why I say within a relevant range, because what about if then we say, but what about if we make 5 million units, or 10 million units, then, the insurance company might say, well, the relevant range from an accounting perspective is between one and one million units. So the cost is fixed. But then, once we make more than a million units, they might say, no, we have to charge you more. The premium that you pay has got to be more because the risk to us as a company is greater. So is it still a fixed cost? Yes, within a relevant range. But if you want to produce 5 million units, then we've gone outside the relevant range, and now they're going to charge us a higher amount for our insurance premium. 
Variable costs are the costs that vary with the production quantity. So if we make one unit, our variable costs are $10. If we make two units, it's $20. Three units, $30. 100 units, $1,000. A million units, the variable cost is $10 million. So in other words, it means the more units that we make, the greater the cost. So for example, the longer that we're running the equipment, the more electricity that we're going to use. The more units that we make, let's say, the more plastic that we use. So if we make one unit, and let's say each unit requires an ounce of plastic, so we use one ounce of plastic. If we make a million units, then we're going to use a million ounces of plastic. So the cost of plastic, the total cost for plastic, the total variable cost, the total variable cost, all right, pay attention, the total variable cost is going to increase. The unit variable cost might stay the same or it might go down. Why? Why might it go down? If we go from making one unit to making a million units, why would our variable cost change? In fact, in this case, why would we say it might actually go down? So our total variable cost, when we went from making one unit to one million units, our total variable cost increased. Our total fixed cost stayed the same. So we're using more plastic. So the total variable cost is increased because now instead of one ounce of plastic, we're using a million ounces of plastic. The unit variable cost might stay the same, but it might also go down because now if we're consuming a million ounces of plastic, maybe we could send Evan to the supplier and he could negotiate a better price for us per ounce. So the unit variable cost could go down if we get a discount. So the variable cost, the total variable cost, we could expect to go up when the production quantity increases, but the unit variable cost would usually, unless we get a better deal, the unit variable cost would stay the same. Total fixed cost will stay the same when the production quantity increases. The unit fixed cost is going to go down. You see why that is? Because that means that the more units that we produce, the smaller the amount of fixed cost each item is going to have to absorb. Questions? All right, so let's go through the um, quiz G. Who's going to answer the first question? The largest personnel requirement abroad for most companies is E, the sales force. That's on page 498. Remember, I had emphasized in class that, yes, we're going to have to deal with this manufacturing issue. We're going to have to decide if we're going to be make to stock or make to order. We're also going to have to decide if we're going to make or buy. So are we going to make the product or are we going to buy it from somebody else? Are we going to engage in contract manufacturing or sourcing? And we agreed that that was something that we need to needed to resolve as we think about selling our product all around the world. We needed to decide whether we're going to have bodily equipment in every market or we're going to have maybe a regional manufacturing facility that could ship to countries in that region. And I said, we need to address that, but certainly an equally important issue is the people that we're going to need 
to function as our sales force for our marketing and sales organization. And so we thought about, well, how are we going to do that? So how are we going to staff this sales organization? And we came up with a number of different options. And so the next question says, a blank is a person who leaves their home country to work for their domestic employer in a country. And the best answer is E, e expatriate. So it could be an expatriate or it could be, we said, a local national. But in this case, this is the definition of expatriate. So if you said, well, what is expatriate? Well, this is it. And we said it's very costly for an organization to send personnel from the home country to the host country. And we said that's not always desirable either. We don't want to have everybody there being an expatriate. We want to have local nationals who have insight into the market. Isn't that right? So we don't want to just send um, 300 people from headquarters in Georgia and send them to Paris to work because it's tremendously expensive. It's a huge endeavor and we want to benefit from the experience and insights and knowledge of the people that live and work in that market. The next question is, which of the following is the main disadvantage of local nationals? So, although there's some advantages that I just mentioned about hiring <coughs> local nationals, what would be the main disadvantage of doing that? A. Right. A. Go ahead. So, tell us what that is. So the main disadvantage is that headquarters ignores their advice. So the organization has got to decide if they're going to be centralized or decentralized. Are they going to let the strategic business unit in France operate independently or is everything going to be dictated from headquarters or is there going to be an approach, a management approach, um, someplace in between. Because remember we said, well, we don't necessarily need to send a dozen people to that market. Maybe we'll send a few, but maybe instead of sending a lot of expatriates there, maybe what we could do is we could have weekly video conferences. Maybe that's enough to achieve a high level of integration between the home country and the host country, between headquarters and the local market. The next question is C. Third country nationals are a group whose nationality has little to do with where they work or for whom. The next question is also about third country nationals. It says that um, on page 501, the growing use of third country nationals is in part see an acknowledgement that their personal skills and motivation are international values. Questions about that? That's on page 501. The next question says, which of the following external, uncontrollable factors influence the selection of expatriates over local nationals? What do you think? What's the best answer? A, A the host government's attitude towards foreign workers. That's on page 502.
Who can explain what that means? What does that mean when we talk about the government's attitude? Stretching? So basically it means that, well, we might be okay sending expatriates there, but what about the host country? We might be ready. We're going to send three dozen people from headquarters. But what about the host country? They might be like, well, we don't want you here. And there could be any number of reasons why they may not want um, the expatriates there. What might be like one of them? What might they think? What might be one of the reasons why they wouldn't want to have expatriates there? Um, it would cost jobs for the national, nationals. Absolutely. So they figure if you don't send three dozen and the other company doesn't send three dozen and we don't have 25,000 expatriates in our country, then locals would get those jobs. See what Josh was saying? Absolutely. That's certainly one of the things that's of concern to them. Number seven says, compared to the diplomatic skills required in a transnational management position, what are the major skills people operating in the home country require? And the best answer is the attributes of an effective salesperson. That's B. Whereas if you're an executive, if you're part of the management team in an organization that sells their products around the world, well, you need to be more than just a good salesperson. <clears throat> you have to be a good diplomat. So that's what this question is trying to address on page 502. In fact, in that position, you're going to require skills and abilities that might even challenge talented diplomats. Because you're going to be dealing with these issues every day. Not just when it's a crisis, it's every day your challenge is to get work done through others and your corporate culture is different and your, um, the, the culture in which you were raised is also different. You might have different religious beliefs, different traditions, <laughs> norms and customs. So as an executive, this definitely could be even more challenging than if you were an ambassador at the UN, for example. What do you think? Do you see how, that, how that's um, reasonable to say something like that? Because every day you're out there trying to make things happen in a very challenging environment because there are conflicts in culture for example. All right, question eight says, when hiring new personnel, most of the traits necessary for success in international marketing can be assessed by, the best answer is, interviews and role playing. Why do you think tests, this is talked about on page 503, why do you think tests would probably not be a good assessment tool? for this purpose. Because really a test, if you're going to take a written test, it just means that you know what the answer is. It doesn't mean that you could demonstrate that behavior. So if you are going to have an interview or go through a role playing exercise, they want to see. It's not that you know to, on the test you write, um, demonstrate a sensitivity to other cultures demonstrate respect and tolerance 
for diversity and cultural issues. They say, let's sit down and talk. Let's pretend that we were at a business meeting together. Then they want to see if it's really true. When um, the person that you're having the role play with, how you react to them. And that's really best evaluated through um, interviews or some sort of uh, role play. Nine says, which of the following is suggested to make home office personnel more aware of problems of foreign operations? And the best answer is A, cross-cultural training. So the best way to really do that is um, to send people from the home office into the foreign market to observe for themselves. Which of the following represents one of the greatest fears of expatriate managers? So why might not somebody be um, happy to take an assignment, to be an expatriate overseas? Because probably most of you, um, early in your career, you probably feel, well, hey, they're going to send me to China. They're going to send me to where? They're going to send me to um, live. I'm going to live in London. I'm going to live in uh, in. Paris, I'm going to live in Sydney, Australia. Probably, um, I would think, most of you would think, wow, that's exciting. But what's one of the major concerns that um, people have when they <laughs> imagine if you took an assignment in, in China and you were an expatriate there, what would, you, what would be your concern as, as you... Um, being somebody who's career oriented. About you. Yeah, that they're going to forget about you. You're all the way in China. Is a 12 hour time zone difference? There, are they going to remember you that you're there? Who's going to see when you're working 90 hours a week? Who's going to know? Out of sight, out of mind. All right, have a good night.